Okay, good evening, everybody. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I do. Yes, thank you. I'm glad. Yes. I you know, you this is the, it happened two weeks ago. It happened a week ago. So I, I checked all the, all the gear. All the lights are on. All the batteries are going. So, yes. Do we have a volunteer to read Chapter 3 of St. Saint, uh, Saint Peter's second letter? Chapter 3? You have yeah, that's a children's translation. Okay. Um, you can take a New American Bible. That's a good one to take. Chapter three. Chapter three of Saint Peter's letter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, is there? If there's any, I know that's Should be. I'll put it in No, I'm very Yeah, my thing is Because I'll read it as a last resort if anybody. I'll check it in the She's going to read it. Okay. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The reason amen is in brackets is because some of the ancient manuscripts that we have don't have the word amen, and later, later, later uh, versions of it have the word amen. Um, so that's why it's in brackets there. So this last chapter, remember one of the reasons St. Peter writes a second letter, he, 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 he says the reason here. The reason is I'm, I'm writing this is to remind you to stir up your sincere disposition. What type of disposition? That the Lord is going to come again, right? Um, the prophets uh, had prepared for the coming of Christ. The Lord Jesus came. And now through the teaching of the apostles at verse 2, um, uh, that the, the Lord is handing on the truth through prophets, through himself, and through the apostles, right? So he had reminded them or told them that false teachers were going to rise up and that these false teachers began to scoff. The word scoff means to make fun of religious truth, right? Or to, uh, well, yeah, basically, burlarse de la verdad. So to, to um, so something like, to say, okay, well, where's God, you know? Where, where's your God now, you know? And Jesus on the cross was scoffed at. There were scoffers, you know? If you come down, we'll believe you, you know? Um, and so believers began to die and people began to doubt because they thought Jesus was coming back soon. And so some had the temptation to become cynical. Right? We're going to take a look at a few words from the catechism that, that say we're in the last days. Last, last days, we don't know. But uh, we are alive after the coming of the Holy Spirit. So whether the Lord comes 10,000 years from now or 10 hours from now or 10 minutes from now, we're in the last days, right? Um, and the scriptures make reference to that, and it, it does here too. Um, the apparent delay of Jesus' second coming uh, caused doubt. And one of, the, one of the temptations for us is the sin of despair, to despair of God's mercy, to despair of God's love, or even to despair that his second coming won't happen. Okay, so with that, let's open up our catechism to 731, 731 to 734. So this makes a reference to the last days, right? Although the Old Testament doesn't often refer to God as Father, there are at least 11 instances in the Old Testament where the Lord reveals, uh, is referred to as Father. Jesus reveals God as Father. He talks about his Heavenly Father all the time. Uh, the time of his days here on earth were the time of the Son, and now we live in the days of the Holy Spirit. So 731. On the day of Pentecost, when the seven weeks of Easter had come to an end, Christ's Passover is fulfilled in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, manifested, given, and communicated as a divine person. Of his fullness, Christ the Lord pours out the Spirit in abundance. On that day, the Holy Trinity is revealed. Since that day, the kingdom announced by Christ has been open to those who believe in him. In the humility of the flesh and in faith, they already share in the communion of the Holy Trinity. By his coming, which never ceases, the Holy Spirit causes the world to enter into the last days, the time of the church, the kingdom already inherited, though not yet consummated. So the kingdom exists in seed form in the church and is meant to grow and blossom like that mustard seed. We don't know what stage it's at. It could still be in the beginning stages or it could be in the branch stages. What's, what matters to us is that we're faithful. And let's, let's go at least one paragraph more, 733. God is love, and love is his first gift containing all others. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So let's jump to uh, 1021. Loosely go over 1021 to 1039. This treats of what happens, what are the last things. And I, I put it on the handout too, kind of a little, a little schema for us to follow. 
when we die individually, there's an individual judgment. It's called particular judgment. And uh, we'll know. We, we don't even have to have God tell us. We'll know after watching our life, the movie of our life with God, uh, whether we need some purification uh, before entering into, into heaven. Um, so at 1023, heaven, eternal life, eternal happiness, peace. 1030, uh, purgatory, purification, those who die in friendship with Christ but still attached to earthly things or those who merit some temporal punishment due to sin uh, will pass through a purification. Hell is the definitive self-exclusion from God. Then um, we can also speak of a general resurrection or the general judgment. If you think about it, though, we're going to... Will be an individual judgment, and then right away, boom, boom, general judgment, because we begin to enter into a time uh, outside of reality. So, however, time is served in purgatory, we're going to leave that to the Lord. Um, and so, uh, I wanted to make that as a prelude to uh, to 10:40 to 10:48. <clears throat> the Lord never destines anybody <clears throat> for for hell but always destines everyone for eternal life. This paragraph has to do with the general judgment. The last judgment will come when Christ returns in glory. Only the Father knows the day and the hour. Only He determines the moment of its coming. Then through His Son, Jesus Christ, He will pronounce the final victory, final verdict on all history. We shall know the ultimate meaning of the whole work of creation and of the entire economy of salvation and understand the marvelous ways by which His providence led everything toward his final end. The last judgment will reveal God's justice, triumphs over all the injustices created by any one of the creatures, right? And that God's love is stronger than death. The message of the last judgment calls men and women to conversion, while God is still giving them the acceptable time, the day of salvation. It inspires a holy fear. That means reverence and respect and filial love of God. Commits them to the justice of the kingdom of God, proclaims the blessed hope of the Lord Jesus' return when he will come to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all who have believed. So more than once, the Bible talks about the patience of God who gives time for people to be converted, to allow uh, the maximum salvation of souls, right? Um, this is one of the things that we see in Second Peter here, the new heaven and the new earth. Isaiah spoke about this. Also, the book of Revelation speaks about it, but the new heavens and the new earth, right? So, 1048. Um, this brings us to something that, that oftentimes people always ask about, whether or not pets or animals are in, in heaven, right? In the, new he the new heaven and the new earth, right? Isaiah describes the messianic reality of Animals no longer affected by original sin. So my favorite is the, the bear and the cow, right, that are neighbors. And um, the, the lion and the lamb and the, is there a wolf in somebody? I don't think there's a wolf. Is there something, something scary? The, the baby plays with the snake, you know. So a messianic where creation is, is is given a tremendous piece where, where meat-eating creatures and animals no longer eat meat, right? So you take that in tandem with St. Paul's writing to the Romans into what we see here. Uh, do animals have souls? Not like we do. They can't accept Jesus as Lord, right? Um, so if your pet is not in heaven, will you be totally happy? You will be, yeah. I'll be happy without my pet. You'll be happy, right? <laughs> Um, or if your pet is there, will you be totally happy? Yes. But the way, the church, is not, the church has not pronounced either way, right, D definitively whether there are animals in the heavenly kingdom. But there seems to be evidence about this new creation, new her especially Isaiah. When you read Isaiah in light of Christ, it seems like there might be animals. But if not, you're going to be totally happy, okay? So, um, so let's go back to the Bible, the, the biblical text. The, um, this, after speaking about those who scoff, right? Um, how did the Father create everything in verse 5? 
through the word of God, through his son, he pronounced his word and things came into being. More and more we're seeing, um, salud, God bless you. The, um, the Big Bang, I think, is going to be named after the Catholic priest who, 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 found, who, who, who came up with the theory. More and more, the more deeper we go into science, the more we see a communion of science with the Word of God. And that's, that's only obvious because God is both the source of creation and of divine revelation. Right? And so uh, this makes a reference to the separation, well, the creation of everything out of nothing, and then with all this matter that the Lord makes, separating water from earth, light from darkness, right? And then Peter uses this analogy that everything's going to be burned up, dissolved. There'll be no creation, as we know it, like universe and planets and stars, but a new creation that's not affected in any way by an expanding universe or chaos or change, right? But the possibility of growing in happiness and eternal life, growing in peace with each moment, because God is infinite. One day for the Lord is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. So the Lord is not slow in coming his second coming. He desires not anyone to perish, but that all should be saved. God desires that all men and women be saved, come to the knowledge of truth. And so he is, allows for repentance. <clears throat> I think this came up in a first reading this year during the summer. The Book of Wisdom also says, the Lord's patience allows for conversion, right? And how many times the Lord Jesus spoke about how he will come like a thief in the night, right? Unexpectedly, right? And so this is not to scare us, but to teach us that we should always be ready, right? Uh, and that's called the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord is a biblical expression for reckoning, rendering an account of judgment. So you could speak of various days of the Lord. You remember when Babylon conquered Judah and destroyed Jerusalem? That was a day of the Lord, a day of visitation. And the survivors were deported to Babylon. And there was a general sense of discouragement, but there was also like, oh, we blew it. You know, uh, our sins caused this, right? Remember when Jesus wept outside Jerusalem or when he was welcomed by the people, Hosanna in the highest? That was a day of visitation, a day of judgment. The last day of the Lord will be when he comes again. But we could speak of our own personal day when, if, like if one of us dies before his second coming, that'll be our day. That'll be our time to, to render an account to, Lord, to the Lord. So it's used in the Bible to refer to those powerful moments, those turning points in history when God called an account for people's lives. A thief comes unexpectedly and without warning. And so if that's going to happen, what sort of lives ought we to live? The answer is holiness, godliness. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. Now this is, this, I don't, even myself, I don't understand it too much, but hastening. How can we hasten the day of the Lord? Can, can we make it come faster? Not necessarily, but there's a sense that the Lord wants us to ask for it. How many times the New Testament says, Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. And when we say, Venga nosotros tu reino, your kingdom come, your will be done. In other words, we're saying, Okay, Lord, come uh, and, and, and visit us, right? Uh, we're ready for your coming. So, in the sense that God is quick to respond to our repentance, God desires for us to hasten uh, the coming of his reign with the new heavens and the new earth. So, as I mentioned, Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66 speak about the new heavens and the new earth. Um, Revelation chapter one, 21 speaks about the new heavens and the new earth. And also here, um, uh, the new heaven and the new earth. This reality as we know it will end. He makes a reference to um, Paul's letters. So, 
St. Peter is writing these, this letter for the people of Asia Minor. Now, what cities did Paul write to that are in Asia Minor? Ephesus, Colossae, and Galicia, Galatia, Galatians. So Galatians, Ephesians, and Colossians were letters that Paul had already written there. So he's making a reference to these letters as well as other letters of St. Paul. Um, and he says something that we know as, for tr as true as well. Sometimes his letters are hard to understand. <laughs> but some of the ignorant purposely twist to their own destruction the meaning of Paul's letters. So the importance of understanding these letters and divine revelation in the way that God desires, right? Beware lest you be carried away by the error right, of false teachers. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Remember this phrase, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is only particular, only found in First and Second Peter. But now we see how, how universal it is. And that's good, that's fine. But it's uh, interestingly only used here maybe twice in the second letter and also used in the first letter. Then there's a doxology, whenever there's praise, that we call that a doxology. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So, um, not only is Peter aware of Paul's letters, but he gives a little bit of a warning to interpret them well. Paul encouraged all the churches to share his letters among the other communities. In other words, too, St. Peter is already saying St. Paul's letter Letters form scripture equal to the Old Testament, right? That they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. So, God desires all to come to repentance. By living holy lives, we await and prepare for the second coming of Christ, the new heavens and the new earth, to imitate Christ and his love by his teaching. So let's go to, I think we left off, at 671, did we already go there? Were we there already? I think we were. No, no, we weren't. Okay, no. Okay, so this talks about the final subjection. Christ will submit, uh, subject all things to himself. 671. Though already present in his church, Christ's kingdom or reign is never the yet, nevertheless yet to still be fulfilled and expanded with power and great glory by the king's return to earth. This reign is still under attack by the evil powers, even though they have been they have been defeated definitively by Christ's Passover, uh, his Paschal mystery. Until everything is, we could say, finally subjected to him, uh, until there be realized new heavens and a new earth in which justice dwells, the Pilgrim Church, that's us, in her sacraments and institutions, which belong to this present age, carries the mark of this world, which will pass and the, the, the world is passing away. She herself takes her place among the creatures, which groan and travail yet and await the revelation of the sons and daughters of God. This is why Christians pray above all in the Eucharist to hasten Christ's return by saying to him, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, our Lord come. St. Paul says that all creation, plants, animals, all creation, yearns for the second coming of Christ. So that's another phrase that may make it seem, hey, wait a second, maybe there will be animals and plants. In Before his ascension, Christ affirmed that the hour had not yet come. He's going to impose his kingdom when he comes again. Anyone not living his kingdom is going to get, it's going to be totally impo uh, imposed on the last day. 673, since the ascension, Christ's coming in glory has been imminent even though it is not for us to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his authority. This coming could be accomplished, eschatological means, you know, uh, end time coming, right? Could be accomplished at any moment, even if it both and it, the final trial that will precede it are somewhat delayed, right? The glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel, uh, St. Peter says to the Jews after Pentecost, Repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing or refreshment may come from the presence of the Lord, 
that he may send you the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive, ascension, until the time of the establishing that all God spoke by the truth of his holy prophets of old. St. Paul echoes him, for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? The full inclusion of the Jews in the Messiah's salvation in the wake of the full number of the Gentiles will enable the people of God to achieve the measure of the statue, the fullness of stature of the fullness of Christ in which God may be all and all. So let's jump to 1093. So um, So the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. Um, the Holy Spirit prepares us to encounter the Lord. Um, that same Holy Spirit in 1093 fulfills what was prefigured in the Old Covenant, reading the Old Testament. Holy Spirit helps us to pray the Psalms, encounter the Lord in the Psalms. Uh, Holy Spirit helps us to see how the Paschal Mystery of Christ was prefigured in the Old and how uh, to understand it and live it in the New. Let's jump to 1097. In the liturgy of the New Covenant, that is the liturgical year, the liturgy of the hours, every celebration of the sacraments, especially the Mass, uh, it is an encounter between Christ and the Church. The liturgical assembly derives its unity from the communion of the Holy Spirit who gathers the children of God into one body of Christ. This assembly transcends racial, cultural, social, indeed all human affinities, nations, ways of life. The assembly should prepare itself to encounter its Lord and to become a people well disposed. Uh, St. Peter mentions that in this third chapter. I'm writing this so that you can be disposed. Preparation of the hearts is the joint work of the Holy Spirit and of the assembly, especially of its ministers. The grace of the Holy Spirit seeks to awaken faith, conversion of heart, Adherence to the Father's will. These dispositions are the precondition both for the reception of graces conferred in the celebration itself and the fruits of new life in which the celebration is intended to produce afterward. Uh, 1405. I think we're on a roll here. There's no surer pledge or clearer sign of the great hope on the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells than the Eucharist. Every time this mystery is celebrated, the work of our redemption is carried on, and we break the one bread that provides the medicine of immortality, the antidote for death, and the food that makes us live forever in Jesus Christ. So let me just... Some final notes here. Yeah, the Big Bang Theory supports the idea that the world had a beginning in a single instant. More and more scientists are examining this theory. Um, sometimes we may fall into the trap of being too judgmental or prejudging. That sometimes we don't have room for the patience of God, who God seeks to repentance. So St. Peter will make reference of being tender towards those who persist in sin, right? Even those who scoff, right? Naturally, as human beings, we want to fight. Hey, if you make fun of my religion, I'm going to, you know, smack you, you know? No. Um... <laughs> St. Peter means that by our prayers and manner of life, we can participate in the conversion of others and shorten the time and hasten the day of his return. We use First and Second Peter heavily during the Advent season. Why do you think? Two parts to the Advent season. Prepare for the second coming of Christ, and then secondarily to pray, prepare for his birth. So first and second Peter, if it treats of his second coming. So the first part of Advent treats of that. Then the second half has to do with the events surrounding Jesus' birth on earth, right? So there's twofold 
uh, purpose to Advent. That's why we use next week uh, after looking at the letter to Jude, the letter of Jude, St. Jude, we are going to uh, look and see how all three of these books are used in the liturgy. When they appear, what season they appear, what day they come on liturgy. So by doing that, we'll have a deeper idea of what the church is trying to teach us through First and Second Peter. Um, so you guys ready for St. Jude? What time is it? 8.44, good. So three Jameses and three Judes that we need to distinguish between. Even I get confused all the time. So you're familiar with St. James, right? The brother of John, the sons of Zebedee. Uh, he was martyred in 44, probably in Jerusalem. St. James is one of the 12 apostles. He's called St. James the Less, the son of Alphaeus. He also was martyred in Jerusalem. I, if I'm not mistaken, I could be mistaken. In the year 69. Then there's another James, the brother of the Lord, who's a cousin of Jesus, who is the first bishop of Jerusalem. Wait a second. Wait a second. Yeah. First bishop of Jerusalem and wrote the book in the Bible that bears his name, the New Testament. Right? Okay, so we got that. Three Jameses. St. Jude Thaddeus, famoso, right? Everybody knows him. <laughs> Judas Iscariot, also one of the twelve, who betrayed the Lord. St. Jude, the brother of St. James, also known, quote-unquote, brother of the Lord, who's the cousin of the Lord Jesus. This is the St. Jude who writes this letter. So these two bros are cousins of Jesus, and they're, they're brothers, blood brothers, they're cousins of Jesus, and they both have books in the New Testament. This one's five chapters. This one's just, you know, a few verses. So we're going to look at that tonight, right? So it could be a bit confusing. St. Peter might have used this letter. He might have copied some direct phrases from this letter because he likewise speaks of false teachers. It's an exhortation to right living. He also uses Old Testament examples of how people chose to separate themselves from God by sin. He reminds us that the apostles are authentic teachers of divine revelation that Jesus and the apostles warned us about false teachers. I don't remember if he talks about the second coming, so we're going to have to read it. We're going to read it now uh, and see if he does speak about the second coming. So it's after the third letter of St. John in your Bible, so after 3 John should appear the letter of St. Jude. Yeah. All right. Uh, any volunteer to read? Uh, no, after First John, Jude, Saint Jude. After one John, two John, three John, there should be Jude. There you go. It should say, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Do we have a volunteer to read? Okay, 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 good, okay. Once for all, and to the earth. 
appeals to vulnerable and devastated for his condemnation as ungodly, to pervert the grace of our God and to reject our signal and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, when you are fully informed, that the Lord who once for all saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe it. And the angels who did not keep their own position left their proper ground, he has set an eternal chain in deeper darkness for the judgment of the great day. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which in the same manner as they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural lust, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same way, the two chambers also defile the breath to get the glory and flatter the glory of him. But when the archangel Michael contended with the devil and disputed about the body of Moses, he did not dare to bring a condemnation of Simon against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people travel whatever they do not understand, and they are destroyed by those things that, like irrational animals, they know by instinct. Woe to them, for they go in the way of and abandon themselves to Baal and terror for the sake of gain, and perish in chorus rebellion. You have run shares on your love feet, while they communicate to you without fear, feeding themselves. They are waterless clouds carried along by the wind, autumn seeds without fruit, like bread uprooted. Cloud waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars darkness has been reserved forever. It is also about these that do not, in some generations like Adam, prophesy, saying, See, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict everyone of all the deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are grumblers and malcontents. They will judge, indulge in their own lust. They are bombastic and flattering people to their own advantage. But you, beloved, must remember the traditions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers, indulging in their own ungodly lust. It is these worthy, healthy people who void of the Spirit who are causing division. But you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are wavering. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And have mercy on still others with fear, hating even the tunic defiled by their bodies. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling, to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. So you see, amen won't have brackets because the oldest surviving texts that we have of the letter to Jude have that word amen included in it. So, um, on your sheet, you'll see an outline. Yes, question? Well, I, I just have a question. Um, on, on the word Savior, mm-hmm. it's not just capitalized, it's like Savior, Savior, Savior. What verse are you at? So there's a phrase there's a phrase that says the translator is a traitor <laughs> because um, no one will ever get it right right um, but you and I can know that um, if it refers to Jesus and it does you'll have a, a capital S so the word I think is soter let me look to the the Greek yeah it's soter. 
So this this translation has a capital S. <laughs> Traitor. No. no, so well, I mean, think about living in Brawley, you know? You might say something in Spanish and you say, Oh, can you translate it into English? And someone might do it some way, someone might do it another way, right? So um yeah. Make it a big one. No, it's okay. Make it a big go ahead and make it a big S, right? <laughs> Yeah, like capital L, Lord, capital J, Jesus, capital C, Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll see a little um, a little outline here at the bottom of your page. It's only 25 verses. Greeting and address. His intention is to clarify true teaching, to give a little warning uh, about false teachers, and he uses examples from the past. Um what are the fruits of lawlessness and disobedience towards God? Then this mysterious figure, Enoch, we're not going to get to him tonight. We're only going to probably get to St. Michael tonight. Um, the need to follow the apostles' teachings, admonitions, and ex uh, exhortations, and then a doxology. You know, uh, this little article here, What Happens at Death, we cover that in the Spanish class, so I think it's fitting that we're able to, to so it's in between 2 Peter and Jude. What Happens at Death? We naturally fear death because it's the unknown. It's somewhere we, we, we haven't gone that way before. Um, and it's in, the church gives us, in particular, Psalm 23, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So what happens at death is not extinction. It's not the, you're not totally annihilated. Nor is there reincarnation. A Hebrew says people only die once. Nor do we change into an angel. Angels are spirits. They don't, have a, they don't have a body. Nor is it to change into a ghost, a pale copy of what we are in life. By the way, the Bible nor the church does not deny the existence of ghosts. Right? Um, what happens at death is particular judgment. God infallibly knows and judges each soul as either, one, directly able to enter into heaven immediately, or two, in need of final purification, purgatory first, and then entering heaven, or to be sent to Los Angeles, right? No, or to, the, to I shouldn't say that. To be stuck forever in traffic. Um, no, um, so hell is the definitive self-exclusion. God doesn't want anyone to go there. Uh, at the general judgment, uh, the resurrection of the body, so we'll be able to embrace Christ, we'll be able to embrace one another. So it depends on three things. Depends on our free choice, either for or against God, and our life in Christ, holiness. There are two roads, one to the life, one to life, and one to death. God gives us the ability to choose. It, it does not depend wholly on us. It depends on eternal justice and truth, which we cannot change. Even God cannot change us because God's nature. Truth is eternal and unavoidable. We can hide from it only temporarily in denial. Even then, we can only hide from God from our sight, not from Him, like a baby trying to play peekaboo, right? It also depends on God's grace and mercy. No one can buy heaven or earn heaven or force God's hands. Uh, all who are saved are saved by grace, Jesus, or free choice. We are saved by mercy, not by justice. Hell's citizens stand on justice and get it. Heaven's citizens stand under mercy. So the measure with which we measure to others will be the measure that's given to us. And at the end of Jude, we saw this, uh, that, that was mercy. Huh? Mm -hmm. There's a slight reference to the second coming or, or to, um, well, there's a reference, a concrete reference to eternal life there at the end, right? So Judas, the brother of James and a relative of the Lord, he likes to work in threes. So for example, in verse one, he says, you're called, one, beloved, two, and kept safe in Jesus, three, or protected in Christ Jesus. Then he goes into another three. May you receive from God mercy, peace, and love. May these be multiplied to you. I found it necessary, circumstances uh, moved St. Jude, as did the Holy Spirit, to write this letter about false teachers and the necessity to, to live the faith that was given to us by the apostles. Divine revelation was once and for all delivered. So, uh, divine revelation cannot 
be changed. Doctrine cannot be changed, but our understanding of it can deepen. Some have snuck into the assembly. Admission has been secretly gained by those who are seeking to pervert the truth or distort the truth. They desire to take people out of the freedom of Christ and to make them slaves of their passions. And so St. Jude denounces uh, those who uh, purposely distort the faith, right? Um, and he makes references to uh, those who were saved by the water of the Red Sea and then those Egyptians who pursued them and then were washed away. And then makes reference to the angels who they had their opportunity to choose and the ones who chose to serve Satan. Boom, they were cast out, right? And the example of the folks who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. And what other example... In like manner, uh, those who distort the faith uh, will, are making their choice. So, let's go to the Catechism uh, 542. Why, did you, why was Jesus sent from the Father? To save us from ourselves, to teach us how to live, to save us from death, to save us from hell, to protect us from the evil one, to open up the gates of heaven, to share divine life with us, eternal life, to share his whole inheritance with us, and he entrusts to us a mission. It's a mission on behalf of salvation, on, the, on behalf of the forgiveness of sins, of right living and formation of conscience. So at 542, Christ stands at the heart of this gathering of men and women of the family of God. By his word, through signs that manifest the reign or kingdom of God, and by sending out his disciples, that's us, Jesus calls all people to come together around him around his word, around the Eucharist, around his justice and his peace. But above all, in the great Paschal mystery, his death, his resurrection, he would accomplish the coming of his kingdom. Mysteriously, he said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men and women to myself. In this union, into this union with Christ, all men and women are called. Go to 170 to 175. We're lightly going to cover these ones. The language of faith. Oh, yeah. So faith is not about rules or formulas, but in those realities which the formulas express, which faith allows us to touch. The believer's act of faith does not terminate in propositions, but in realities which they express. All the same, we do approach these realities with the help of formulations of the faith, which permit us to express the faith and to hand it on, to celebrate it in community, to assimilate it, or in other words, interiorize it, and to live it more and more. St. Peter, or I'm sorry, St. Paul tells Timothy that the church is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. The church is the servant of divine revelation. She is not its master. So she just she exists to hand it on faithfully, uh, the deposit of faith. She guards the memory of Christ's words. It is she who from generation to generation hands on the apostles' confession of faith as a mother teaches her children to speak, to understand and communicate. The church, our mother, teaches us the language of faith in order to introduce us to the understanding and the life of faith. So one faith, uh, for all peoples of all nations, of all languages, right? And 175, let's see. Mm. So at verses 5 through 7, what we do with our bodies matters. What we do with our choices, right? And so we want to choose right living, Let's see, uh, verse 5. Okay, verse 7. 
at verse 7, when it speaks about sexual immorality, the word is porneia, right? And that means any type of sexual disorder, right? So masturbation, pornography, sex outside marriage, adultery, um, woman and woman, man and man, any type of sexual immorality is not part of God's plan. So it matters to God how we live. So we want to live in right manner, um, not like those who, uh, some translations say, pursue disorder. Some say, pursue desire. All right, so we want to live rightly. The Lord desires for us to believe in Him, to live in and through Him. And we made it in the Spanish class to... St. Michael, who makes an appearance here, right on? Uh, the dreamers. Uh, this refers to, now, there was a legend that the devil wanted to rob Moses' body to defile his body. And St. Michael was standing over the dead body of Moses and simply rebuked him with, his, with a phrase, the Lord rebuke him. So, um, and the and the devil didn't couldn't even touch you know Moses's body, so a reference to the resurrection of the body, the resurrection of the dead, but also an appearance of Saint Michael. Saint Michael makes an appearance in Zechariah chapter three, and also in Daniel, and also during the times of Joshua. The Lord has made Saint Michael a prince of the heavenly hosts. And we, we use that phrase from this part of Jude. The Lord rebuke him. The Lord rebuke him. We, have, we humbly pray, right? Part of the St. Michael prayer. Um, now, remember the choirs of angels, cherubim, seraphim, uh, powers, principalities, virtues, dominations, archangels, and angels. St. Michael is one of the, you know, speaking in military terms, St. Michael is a corporal, and the Lord has made him head of all, Right? So what does that say also about the enemy? The devil, who's the strongest on their team, just with the voice of St. Michael, can't win, right? So this, this, this passage makes a reference to a legendary, a legend that's not part of the scriptures over, over this fight over the body of Moses. And also Enoch, whom we'll get to next week, uh, there are some writings that have to do with Enoch that refer to... Um, the fall of the angels. And a reference is made to that. That the angels all had a choice. Either you're with me or against me. And some of them, as we saw last week, those who made their choice for evil can never be converted. That's it. They're locked into that. So that's, that's part of the deposit of faith. Um, let me just make sure that we got those things we wanted to cover. Uh, St. Jude encourages us to stand firm in the faith, to remain in the love of God. And he speaks about those who scoff, who make fun of God's revelation, who know God's law and purposely promote sexual immorality. Those who take, oh no, this is right. Those promoting lies to take advantage of others. Uh, we already took about the 333. Three, three. Mercy, peace, and love. Uh, let's see. Religion and spirituality. The word religion comes from the Latin word relegate, which means relationship. And spirituality, our capacity to transcend oneself. There's often promoted the, the idea of being a spiritual person, but not wanting to be associated with any organized religion, creed, or dogma. Instead, people want to shape religious practice to suit our own moral views and preferred manner of life. But the Christian faith is not something that we can pick and choose or something we invent or mold for our own preferences. It is given by God, the deposit of faith. God is a living God, and He really desires our salvation, and it's love. And so when we love, We'll seek to live 
in the freedom of God's children and not giving ourselves over to something that is the opposite of love or contrary to the way we, which we were created or made for. So I think we're going to stop there. Nine, oh, good. Uh, and the, the scriptures move us to prayer, so uh, we'll conclude with a blessing now. And we'll, we'll, we'll cover Jude again next week, as well as read Philemon, the letter of St. Paul to Philemon. Um, we're going to have an extra class. Well, I intended to go through all through the Tuesdays in November, except for, what's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving? Uh, 20th. That's going to be our last gathering together. So next week is the, what's today? Today's the 6th, the 13th. 13th, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up Jude, and we'll talk about Jude, First and Second Peter, and the liturgy, and uh, some of the early commentaries of the church. And then maybe on the 20th, we can do Philemon, because it's a really short letter. It's one of St. Paul's shortest letters. So instead of three books of the New Testament, we could cover four. That would be great. Yeah. So let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you for having destined us for eternal life. You've made each and every one of us unique, unrepeatable, irreplaceable, precious. You desire for us to make it to the heavenly kingdom and to please you with lives of love and holiness here on earth. Help us all to be ready for our own personal death or for the second coming when that moment arrives. And we do pray to you on behalf of our sick family members and friends, uh, on behalf of those who have separated themselves from the practice of their faith. Uh, we give to you our community, our nation, and our state. And we humbly ask your blessing upon us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, see you next week. Those who would like to...